Welcome everyone to this uh, webinar um, about AI in Asia and the Pacific. Uh, my name is Eleanor, I work at Oxford Insights, who together with the International Development Research Centre in Canada, publish annually the Government AI Readiness Index. And we've brought together this panel today to discuss uh, AI in Asia and the Pacific, talk a little bit about the index and also some of the other issues facing the region. Um, with me on the panel today, we've got a, an excellent lineup. Um, we have uh, Toby Walsh, who's the um, Laureate Fellow and Scientia Professor of Artificial Intelligence at the University of New South Wales, leads the Algorithmic Decision Theory Group at Data61. Um, he's been elected a Fellow of the Australian Academy of Science, a Fellow of the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence and of the European Association for Artificial Intelligence. He was also named by an Australian newspaper as a rock star of Australia's digital revolution. Um, we also have uh, Malavika Jayaram. She's the inaugural executive director of the Digital Asia Hub. She's a faculty associate at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. Uh, she was a technology lawyer for over 15 years and has been on the executive committee of the IEE Global Initiative on Ethics of Autonomous and Intelligent Systems and on the high level expert advisory group for the OECD's Going Digital Project. And finally, we have Anshul Sonak, who is a digital, uh, sorry, a senior director of Intel's Global AI and Digital Readiness Program, and has also been a trusted advisor to government, civil society, and academia around digital re readiness and inclusive innovation. He is UNDP Asia's first youth collab champion, and also a judge at, in MIT's Inclusive Innovation Challenge. He's worked in India, the US, the UAE, Malaysia, now in Singapore, so he's particularly well placed to give a good overview of the region that we're going to be covering. So a little bit more about the running order for today. Um, I'll start by giving a short presentation on the index and some of the findings for Asia and the Pacific. Then we'll hand over to our panelists who will each make a, a brief five minute presentation of opening remarks covering some very different areas or, um, and issues to think about. And then we'll open it up to a Q&A and a bit more of a general discussion. So um, throughout, please feel free to um, type questions either into the uh, chat or into the Q&A specific function, and then we'll uh, collate those at the end and ask them to the panelists and get a bit of a discussion going. Um, so without further ado, I will um, set up my presentation. Okay. So as I mentioned, uh, the Government AI Readiness Index, it was published a couple of weeks ago, the 2020 edition. Um, just to give you a bit of background, this is the third version that we've done of the index. We started in 2017 with only 35 countries and it's now expanded to be worldwide. And this year we're covering three times as many indicators as last year. So we hope it's a much more comprehensive measure of AI readiness across the world. The three most important hypotheses I think to know about with the index are three things that we're really trying to measure to understand government AI readiness is um, these three things. So we think AI readiness means that the government needs to be willing and able to adopt AI and able to um, innovate to do so. The government needs a good supply of AI tools from the technology sector. And these tools need to be built and trained on high quality and representative data and need the appropriate infrastructure to be delivered and used by citizens. Um, I put here, we don't need to go through all of the, the, the various dimensions, but we also then break down these three kind of big pillars of the index, government, technology sector, data and infrastructure, into various dimensions into which we sort the other indicators. So you've got things like, for example, vision is whether or not you have a, a, a national AI strategy. Um, human capital in the technology sector looks at issues of kind of digital skills and STEM education and within data and infrastructure, data representativeness, which was a new thing that we tried to measure this year, kind of looks at how likely do we think you are to capture representative data that means that you're not going to be training biased algorithms. Also this year for the first time and something that possibly we might discuss a bit further in the Q&A because it is a very, it's a difficult thing to measure, but it's a very important topic is responsible use. So we wanted to look at not just how ready governments are to use AI, but also whether they are likely to use it in a responsible manner. So we set up a kind of pilot where we looked at a few different um, pillars and these were roughly corresponding to the OECD principles on AI. So we looked at inclusivity, accountability, transparency and privacy. And you can see there some of the things that we were trying to measure under those um, headings. So we did that with just 35 countries this year um, and we're hoping to expand it in future. This is just a, a chart showing what the, the landscape looks like uh, in Asia in terms of um, AI readiness. So some of the top scoring countries in Asia are, I think it's a Singapore, uh, the Republic of Korea, Australia, um, 
Japan uh, and China. And definitely, again, possibly a question for the Q&A discussion. Uh, we're very conscious that China is renowned for being a uh, significant AI leader, but in our index, something about our methodology, and um, we can definitely discuss in more detail why that might be, uh, China is about uh, 19th globally. So uh, definitely some interesting questions there about the differences between AI readiness, perhaps, and AI implementation. Are countries that are the most ready necessarily the ones that are actually driving forward implementation the most? And finally, um, just looking at, so uh, the pilot um, did not cover all countries in the index, but it did cover these following countries in Asia and the Pacific. And what we can see here is perhaps a trend towards, and this was true of um, a lot of advanced nations that we looked at in terms of um, AI readiness, the US and the UK as well, um, scoring kind of noticeably less well in the responsible use index than they did in the main index. So there are definitely interesting questions around how can we make sure that the most AI ready countries are also thinking about responsible use, given that perhaps at the moment they might not be best placed to use AI responsibly. Um, with that, I'll leave um, a lot of those questions kind of open ended and allow our panelists to maybe touch on them in some of their presentations or otherwise um, feel free to ask questions in the Q&A and we'll definitely get into some of those issues in our later discussion. Um, but I will stop sharing my screen for now and hand over to um, Toby Walsh for the first of our panelists presentations. Thank you, thank you. Um, in Australia, we have a fine tradition of uh, acknowledging the traditional owners of the land upon which we meet. So I will acknowledge uh, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and extend my welcome to all um, indigenous owners of all the lands on which all of us may be meeting. Um, I want to just talk about two things. Uh, first of all, when we see an index like this, people start to think about this being a race as to who's going to win the race. And there've been lots of pr proclamations that um, it's a race between the United States and China. Europe isn't even in third place and uh, where would the rest of um, the Pacific Rim be? Um, and I like to point out to people that it's actually a very misguided idea to think of this as a race. I mean, there is a scientific race um, and uh, in science you only get credit if you are the first to win. Um, but um, I th the way to think about it, I think, is to think about another pervasive technology that was a race in some sense, which was electricity. And like AI is often compared to electricity, it's going to be a technology um, like electricity that's in all our homes and all our offices and all our factories and changes the way that we do everything. Um, but uh, there wasn't one country that won the electricity race. It wasn't Westinghouse or Edison or anyone else who won the electricity race. I mean, they were earlier pioneers and they got some of the patents at the start, but the whole world got to profit from electricity. All of us use electricity today. All of us, um, all our countries have companies whose business depends um, entirely upon electricity, whether it's powering our devices or, or, or running our data. Um, and so all of us stand to profit from this race. So um, whilst we see this index, it's not to, not to be thought that only the people at the top of the index are going to win this race. It's a matter of, of how quickly we profit from, from this technology. Um, and then the second thing I want to talk about is just the lessons um, that we learned here in Australia. I was privileged to chair the committee writing the plan for Australia. The um, chief scientist uh, asked myself to chair the committee that wrote um, an AI plan for Australia. And we came up with six very simple lessons actually that apply pretty much, I think, to, to most sized nations that I want to share with you, which are, are what are the things you should be thinking about if you want to move yourself up that index. Um, the first one is, is to realize that there's a huge opportunity here, a huge opportunity, um, various estimates, uh, $17 trillion, 15% or something to the world's GDP that's going to be added. Well, um, and it's worth realizing why this index is important is because um, a big chunk of the world's economy is government. In even developed countries, um, most of a third of your economy, somewhere between a third and a half of your economy, is what the government does. It's not what business does, it's what government does. Um, and so there's a huge great potential opportunity to deliver those services more efficiently, more effectively, more target, more targetedly um, to people. Um, but that's not without risks. And there are, there are immense risks here. Uh, we see them some, some of the risks we're already starting to experience. Um, in some developed countries. Um, and some of those risks are things that um, I've been very vocal about, like autonomous weapons, uh, like invasions to our privacy. So it's, there is immense opportunity, but not without risk. Uh, the second uh, lesson that we wrote down for the government was that earning public trust will be absolutely critical. And we're already seeing uh, a tech clash, we're already seeing examples where that trust is starting to be misplaced. 
Um, and there are plentiful examples of, of tech companies behaving badly, of uh, governments uh, failing to implement the technology in a responsible way. So it's incredibly important to see uh, the responsible index side of it and to worry about how responsibility may be lagging implementation. And the third lesson was that, um, that we are starting to see the necessity for strong governance and a responsive regulatory system. I think um, 10 years ago, uh, five years ago even, people thought that you couldn't and you shouldn't regulate the tech space, that that would stifle innovation and somehow you couldn't because the digital space was somehow special. Uh, it didn't have physical presence and so it was hard to regulate. I think we're discovering quite the opposite. You can and you should. Um, and there are plentiful examples. Um, and Europe, I think, is really leads the way here. Uh, we, we frequently look at the shining example of Europe in terms of trying to regulate the tech space. GDPR is a, a good example, a beginning, not an end of an example of how you can uh, regulate in a responsible way to give people privacy. Uh, the fourth lesson we had, uh, there's only six, so I'm nearly through the list. Fourth lesson is that AI is being driven by data um, and we need therefore to worry about data, about issues around data. And that's of course um, really critical for government because the government is actually has more data than almost any other business on the planet um, and, and is trusted uh, in many cases um, reasonably so um, by the public with that data. And so it's an incredibly important role to, to think carefully through and to, to, to regulate responsibly with that data. Uh, the fifth lesson is that humans will need a broad range of skills. Uh, some of them will be very old fashioned skills as well, not just uh, new digital skills, but some of those very people facing skills that, uh, use, uh, that uh, were very important in the past. Um, and because there will be lots of people whose jobs get displaced uh, and we should think in a careful way about making sure that those people are reskilled and brought along and, it's, um, and not thrown out onto the scrap heap of unemployment. Um, and the sixth uh, recommendation we had for the Australian government, but one that I think uh, works for most governments is that um, these um, uh, AI is still a technology that requires sophisticated skills. In many cases, it requires PhDs to, to drive it. Um, those aren't skills that are found everywhere, not everywhere in government, not everywhere in business. Um, and um, certainly in terms of thinking about how you regulate and, and uh, innovate responsibly. Um, and therefore it's worth thinking about whether you have an appropriate body, we recommend the government an independent AI body could bring together those skills. We see such bodies in some of the leaders, um, things like the Turing Institute in the UK, um, leading the way in innovating in a responsible way, helping government um, in these matters. And so um, you see that um, in some of the leaders here in, in the Pacific Rim. You see, see this in particular in places um, like Singapore, um, where um, they have uh, a number of uh, different government bodies that um, are leading the way and helping government to, 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 to uh, innovate responsibly. Um, so I'm going to finish there. Um, other than to make a final quick plug, if you want to know, I have written a book recently on the topic called 2062, The World That AI Made, that covers many of these uh, issues in much greater detail, available in many languages in this region. Great, Toby, thank you so much. Um, and I, for one, will definitely be checking out the book. Uh, and I also really appreciate that you started us off, kicked us off with the, the really important point that this is not a race. And we're always very conscious that every time we do this, it does something look like something like a race to be doing this ranking, but that's really not our intention. And I completely agree with you that we need to make sure that there's a more collaborative, cooperative approach, I think more initiatives like the the global partnership on ai hopefully indicate that people are interested in collaboration but it's always important to keep pushing that um more collaborative and cooperative approach um and with that i'll hand over to uh, malavika thanks eleanor thank you um really glad to be here i think i really appreciate everything that toby said and i was thinking about this idea of the race that propels so much uh, of the framing in this space. And I was actually going to make a more provocative remark that maybe if we do want to think in terms of a race, it would be fantastic if the race was around creating ethical and responsible AI, rather than just about deploying AI at any cost for any reason in any kind of industry. I think if we did want to compete, actually competing on the level of promoting ethical principles, governance procedures, um, different kinds of legal infrastructure. I think in the same way that a company like Apple has chosen to focus on privacy as a feature and not a bug and has actually tried to compete on that level. I think one way of actually making up the sort of deficiencies in this race uh, and in your index 
would be to actually promote those kinds of values and to actually work harder on those than just on the scientific um, development. So I think you can sort of gamify the race in ways that are actually benevolent. So that, that would be really interesting to see. And I think that's particularly interesting and useful because I think especially in Asia, there is this sense that AI is seen as a way to leapfrog many other stages of development where countries have failed, countries have had gaps, and they see artificial intelligence or, and I use it in a very broad sense. I know any actual scientist would never use AI as a very broad term. It's people who don't actually work in AI use the term AI as a catch-all. So I recognize, you know, we, we usually mean machine learning or other kinds of techniques, but I'll just use AI for now. But I think what's interesting is countries that use AI as a way to catch up, as a way to leapfrog stages of development, and who see it as a way to finally have something to say. Um, I think that's enormously powerful because say a country like India recognizes that there aren't many areas where it can truly be world beating, but it's taken the view that the one area where it can absolutely be number one is in its population. Right, so it's taken the view that it has to treat the data of all of its people, of its citizens as a national asset, right? So it thinks if data is going to power AI, well, they've got more data than most other people, right? So that's kind of very implicit in its e-commerce strategy in many of the policies that are coming up. And I think it'll be really interesting to see how that actually still preserves privacy and actually understands the role of consent and whether people who are illiterate, who don't have digital skills, whether there's a digital divide at play that excludes them in different ways, um, whether you can truly include all of that data without it being problematic, I think that would be an enormous challenge. But I think it's something that countries like India are really trying um, to work on. Um, one thing that's interesting in this space also is that a lot of the archetypes and case studies and the empirical data is always generated somewhere else. When we're trying to create local policy, we're always using examples from somewhere else. We're talking about what Germany did or you know, credit scoring somewhere else or policing of African-American neighborhoods in America or bias in other kinds of ways. And I think there isn't a lot of really rigorous scholarship and field work that actually looks at how this plays out locally under local constraints, local context, language divides. Um, and I think that's something as a field we should really be pushing for because I think governments in this area can be, in this region can be very, very disingenuous when it comes to policy making. On one hand, they don't want to listen to local experts they, unless it has the stamp of a Harvard, Oxford, Cambridge, UNSW, whatever, they're not interested. They don't treat it as rigorous enough but on the other hand, when they really do cherry pick which studies they want to incorporate and be advised by when it comes to policy making, because if it doesn't suit their end goals, um, when local activists and grassroots um, organizations make certain claims, then it's very easy to say, oh, we're just gonna disregard that because it, you know, it doesn't apply to this country or to that country. So I think, that kind of very disingenuous cherry picking of data that suits the end goal that government wants to land at. I think we're seeing a lot of that. So it would be really interesting to boost scholarship in this region to have more context sensitive local use cases that can help drive and inform policy making. Um, and I think with a lot, there's a lot of new, uh, new wine and old bottles kind of thing happening here where, um, a lot of people are just packaging analytics and you know big data and saying, oh, this is a new AI tool. When you actually look under the hood, it's actually not that sexy or interesting. But I feel people feel a lot of pressure to say that this is AI and to stick an AI label on it so they can get funding, whether it's from venture capital or whether it's NGOs and civil society that are now trying to get funded. If they're not working on AI, nobody's interested in funding old school issues. So I think we're seeing a lot of organizations having to repackage their existing work, whether it comes to domestic violence or gender or content moderation online. A lot of it is you know, on hate speech, on riots, on you know, polarized media. 
a lot of that has to be sort of seen through the lens of AI in order to get funding. Um, and I think that's on one hand, really, really productive and useful because you really need these voices who have decades of experience in handling civil society claims and issues and to actually put human rights in the center of a lot of the conversations. So I think that trend is constructive in certain ways, but I think to the extent that people feel unless they're working in the AI field in some way, shape or form that they won't get funding. I feel a lot of issues that are still very much um, unsolved things that really do need resources, you know, even simple things like lobbying for privacy legislation in countries that don't have one. I think some of those issues are falling by the wayside in favor of the more um, emerging technology focused initiatives. So I think civil society is, is finding it really hard. They're sort of stuck between a rock and a hard place when it comes to how they shape their work going forward, what uh, gets to stay on their agenda and what falls off. Um, so that's a danger that I want to warn about. And, you know, so the diversion of resources and attention disproportionately towards this field is something that I'm, I'm very cautious about. Um, and I think the final point I'll make is there's a lot of really interesting work around um, fairness in AI and, you know, the, the, a whole new field of uh, fair machine learning, which, which is really fantastic to see it develop and become a really robust, healthy field. Um, and there's a wonderful paper on uh, fairness in socio-technical, fairness and abstraction in socio-technical systems with Janet Bertese, Dana Boyd, Suresh Venkata Subramaniam, Andrew Zelbst. Um, they talk about a few fallacies and traps when governments and companies are trying to deploy AI. Uh, you know, everything from the computer science field is sort of brought up on this idea of abstraction and modularity and the, you know from day one in class you're taught to think in terms of abstract concepts and to be able to reuse and re remake and not reinvent the wheel every single time but one of the traps when that happens is if you port a system that's meant for one context into something completely different where it no longer makes sense um, that can be problematic create something for a corporate um, space and then you port it into government where different norms and rules and regulations might apply, um, you might lose out on something there. And I think the other point they make, which is really important, is that often the field treats fairness as if it ought to be a property of the AI system itself, uh, which kind of misses the wood for the trees because fairness isn't always a system property. It's often a property of the field into which you're deploying a particular tool or technique. So if you don't look at procedural fairness, if you don't look at the fact that even though an automated um, system could really help with decision-making in courts or actually be less biased relative to human judges who might make very, very um, different decisions based on whether they've had lunch or haven't had lunch, whether it's early in the morning or late in the evening, you know, and, and whether they have sort of implicit bias when it comes to race, when it comes to ethnicity. Uh, so there could be a system that's actually much more fair. But if you don't recognize that people still need their day in court, or there are other properties of legal systems that need to be met, just deploying an algorithm into that kind of a setting while ignoring all the other sort of pomp and circumstance and rules and human rights concerns that need to sort of allow the algorithm to be embedded in a respectful way, I think that's also important, right? So it's not just about whether the algorithm is more accurate and fair, but also about all the other procedural um, elements that need to be combined along with an algorithm. And you know, some of the examples they give are, um, you could have a judge turn around and say, I'm not allowing a computer to tell me how to do my job. I've been doing this for 20 years. I'm going to completely ignore this recidivism score that this algorithm gives me, which would be a shame because that might be more accurate than anything the judge would ever come up with. But on the other hand, at the other end of the spectrum, you could have a judge that says, oh, this is excellent. The algorithm pretty much does my job. I'm just gonna sit here and like let the algorithm work and sort of be asleep at the wheel, which means that 
most of the time for the mean, the algorithm may be fantastic, but when it comes to the edge cases and the outliers where you do need human discretion, where you do need the judge to actually be a little more humane or show some discretion where it isn't a clear cut case. Um, if the judge is asleep at the wheel and thinks the algorithm can just replace him, that's also an opportunity lost. So I think keeping these kinds of different archetypes and contexts into which you're deploying tools and technologies is really important. So I would really hope that going forward, some kind of an interdisciplinary uh, approach to this is uh, incentivized and that governments keep this in mind and don't just, you know, as Toby said, that there are all kinds of human skills that still remain in incredibly important that will never be automated out of existence. And I think, you know, whether it's human in the loop, over the loop, out of the loop, whatever kind of system works for that context, I think it's really important to be very careful about what you choose. And the last thing is just that in Asia, we see a lot of how do we deploy AI and what are we deploying and a lot less of why are we doing this and whether we should do this. And I think that would be my final point that I would urge the whys and the weathers to be very, very central to this discourse. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Malvika. I mean, just so many interesting points there that I'm sure we can unpack later in the Q&A. One thing that I just wanted to pick up on is um, your point about kind of funding and hype around AI and the need to kind of have an AI label to attract attention. Um, I remember a year or so ago watching a speech by the chief technology officer for the British Transport Police and she was asked a question by the audience saying oh you know the police quite a hierarchical organization do you find it difficult to advocate for technological change and innovation she said opposite problem my boss comes in he's read an article on the tube saying AI is going to do xyz and he's like I want to get our AI in now and she's like okay but we have really old data servers that we need to update it's all the kind of unsexy stuff that often gets missed because people are chasing the next big solution rather than, as you say, thinking about some of the other problems that still need to be solved. So I think that point is really important to bear in mind. Um, thank you so much. And uh, Anshul, do you want to wrap us up? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm going to use a few slides just to make my point. Uh, let me see if I can share my slides very clearly. Uh, host disabled participant screen sharing. Oh, I think but sharing is disabled. So it's okay, I can live without that. Oh, you're on mute. Uh, I've just I've just done it, I think. So you should be able to share it now. Okay, yeah, thank you. Okay, cool. Okay, so uh, I'm Anshul. I, I represent Intel here. And uh, as you as you know, Intel, uh, Intel Corporation uh, is uh, uh, creating foundational technologies, including AI, which uh, kind of touches everything right from PC to server to all the data center and data enabling, uh, where data moves, be it storage, be it processing and everything else, right? And our purpose statement is to really enrich the life of every person on the earth with whatever technology we create. And I think there's a lot of mysticism as we are hearing from both Toby and Malvika on what exactly AI is, right? How do we really explain AI to a common person so that uh, the human intelligence and not just artificial intelligence, right? Really have a power of making a difference. And that's, that's a space I'm very passionate about. And how do we really demystify? How do we really democratize AI for a wider population in that sense, right? So in, in this journey, I mean, uh, what, what you guys are doing in, as, an Ox, uh, as an Oxford Inside Government uh, AI readiness, uh, what we have seen is from a government side, right, really building that right human capital, uh, digital capacity, innovation capacity, that is an absolutely critical point. And for that to really come out, uh, AI skills crisis is hurting. I mean, it's hurting not just industry, uh, which is definitely there, but it's hurting larger government. So creating an appropriate understanding of governments on how to overcome larger, and when I say larger, I mean both tech skills and the non-tech or social skills, and Malvika touched upon a lot of that. I mean, the fairness, ethics, biases, inclusion, so and so forth, right? How do we really bring that so that we are not further multiplying the digital divide, which is already there. I mean, the AI divide can be much worse than the digital divide, which we are seeing already on the ground, right? 
So how do we make it more inclusive? So we do multiple programs and initiatives. And one of the, uh, I'm going to give you one of the examples of that. This is one program which we are doing around the world right now. It's called AI for Youth with government partnerships. And the goal is to really reach by 2030, 30 governments, enable 30,000 institutions, partners, and really train 30 million people on AI skills, both tech and non-tech skills for current and future job. Right. So that's a bold commitment which we are putting together with the hope that it creates a larger rally cry. And, and uh, this is our larger corporate uh, commitment to make technology fully inclusive and expand digital readiness, especially around topics like AI. Right. And, and that's where uh, we are. I mean, at this point of time, we have 11 countries uh, who are in this journey with us, 11 country governments who are participating. And then when we uh, talk to these government partners, be it Ministry of Education, Ministry of Skill, Ministry of IT, they really try to ensure a very systemic, scalable, solution-driven model whereby AI gets really demystified for the entire range of human capital, public, school population, future workforce or technical workforce, community colleges in US, vocational schools in Singapore, as an example, so on and so forth, and the current workforce itself, which is going through automation and COVID impacting them double hit, right? Uh, so upskilling and reskilling of the current workforce. So creating a range of programs. And in Asia right now, we are doing it in five countries. So, I mean, I can share with you a lot of my learnings on what is working and what is not working. But I think the best way to really demystify this is to give real example, which anybody can understand, right? And I mean, that's what, I mean, what I believe really showing the role model on how it works at a grassroots level, right, will make a difference because we are in a long journey here as Toby and Malvika already explained. So, I mean, I'll give you one example. And if this one example make government to sit up and understand, then we see the multiplier effect very easily. So this is a real example from a rural India, a 15 year old girl going through the program, a full program, and then she learns how to use computer vision techniques in her own day-to-day -day life identify mental depression and we are talking about uh, uh, mental depression i mean this week is a mental wellness week so she did this fantastic job of using computer vision to predict mental depression for among her own class students so to say and then created an algorithm which can predict and then alert her own teacher and this is done in a very small scale as a 15 year old you can imagine right but what happens is then school understand how to really encourage her, right? And that's how you're creating an AI readiness mindset. So it's not just skill set or technology tool set, but a whole mindset, right? On that you can really learn AI. You can really apply AI to solve a real problem. And then when she shows that as a solution, right? To the industry, to the government, then that creates hope. But that's what we need to mentor. That's where we need to really ensure all the guardrails of ethics, inclusion, biases, privacy, plus the technology side comes together. Now, the impact at a last mile here is very important. So in this particular case with the girl, when we did that uh, over a period of six month time, now we are at a stage whereby this girl coming from a background where her father is a peon in a government job, she, uh, her, at her, uh, nobody has spoken English earlier, and now she's wanting to be an AI ethics lawyer. So range of skill set and mindset along with just access to tool sets. So access to technology will happen over a period of time here. But how do we create that right mindset? I think that's a big journey for us. I mean, again, I mean, I can give you many examples, but just last two, three days, uh, if you're following social media, at least in India, for example, right? So we just did yesterday, a Guinness Book of World Record with Ministry of Education and Prime Minister's Office to train 13,000 school kids on a basic AI lesson so that they start understanding the basics of AI. I mean, they will not become, not everybody has to become an AI coder or a programmer or machine language expert or a data scientist, but they need to start thinking about it at an early age that artificial intelligence, AI in that sense is, is not just technology. It's a form of study. It's a form of intelligence. There are emerging issues on AI and hence uh, right human uh, machine partnership is absolutely critical. So that's, that's the journey we are in. And the idea is, 
to really get governments to be a partnering in this in a very big way. So again, coming back on that India example of Guinness Book of World Record, uh, the population scale AI is the narrative we are working on I and mean, really work across the strata of population. It will take time. It's not going to be easy. So Ministry of IT is doing something uh, for responsible AI for youth, a program which goes into the government school. Uh, the education board, like central board, has brought in AI as a vocational subjects in the school over there, right? And uh, just last week, Prime Minister Rick actually did a responsible AI for social empowerment conference, whereby we brought in 600 decision makers from state governments and industries together to really discuss some of these issues so that in a large scale model, how do we really make it happen? Democratization and demystification is not going to be easy. There are going to be lots of barriers as we go beyond the premium tech industry and the premium universities and the premium countries. That's a scale challenge here. And that will require a lot of public private partnerships and a lot of deeper dialogues and understanding. And that's the journey we are taking through this. That's what I wanted to share. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. It's so interesting to hear um, more about, as you said, that journey you're on to try and demystify the process. I think you're so right about even if people don't need to go on to be able to pursue an, a PhD, just empowering people to understand because I think it's so little understood and often people feel disempowered because they think it's this thing that's going to happen to them rather than a process that they can shape. So that is a really um, important part of this this whole process of making sure that it's a kind of inclusive, um, it, we, we have inclusive innovation and innovation that's kind of people focused. Um, thank you so much to all the panelists. Um, I'll give the audience a couple of questions, couple of minutes to just type out any questions if there's anything you want to ask. Otherwise, I'm sure I can kick things off with a question of my own. But um, let's just give it a minute and see if anyone jumps onto the Q&A or the chat with anything that they wanted to add. Oh, okay, great. Um, so Scala asks, how best to deal with the question of whether fairness, responsibility and ethics are locally contextual, especially when there is the concern that we could go the other way and end up culturally relative? Really interesting question. Thank you. Um, I guess Malavika, do you want to do you want to kick, kick us off with um, this question of, especially because you were talking about both making solutions locally contextual, but also the issues of fairness? Do you think that there, we do need to make sure that our kind of ethical principles are locally contextual or do, are there more universal principles that can be followed? Yeah, I think the very simple answer is that human rights actually provides that universal frame. I think once you acknowledge that those are things that most countries are bound to by treaty obligations and are signatories to all kinds of different human rights conventions, I think that provides a really good base um, of you know harmonized principles that apply across the world because I think otherwise you do get into this space where you do need to be respectful about local context and to think about it when you decide what to deploy and how but I think if you make fairness itself something that's culturally relative um, it's going to be a, you know a, a race to the bottom I think human rights are really good as a ceiling Right. Um, I feel that exactly in the same way that um, companies, when it comes to countries that will actually lower their standards, they're very happy to adopt local norms. But when it comes to actually increasing their obligations, um, then they suddenly decide that, oh, no, actually, we're a Delaware corporation and that's all we're going to care about. If your country has higher norms, well, we don't need to comply with them. So I think companies are very cynical when it comes to this kind of cultural relativism. And that's why I think if you keep coming back to human rights principles, they are universally understood and they are seen as essential um, and they are a baseline. So I guess that's my sort of simple answer. I'm sure Toby has more interesting ways to deal with it from an actual technical perspective rather than just a legal one and how you can embed them within systems. Yeah, Toby, Toby, did you want to come in here and how, do you yes, have Yes, I'm going to completely disagree, I'm afraid, with you there, which is, uh, first of all, from, from a historical example, which is that um, AI is often compared to electricity. I mentioned that in my uh, opening remarks. 
Um, and if we think about that, I mean, it's a, uh, electricity was a much simpler technology that we rolled out across the planet. And yet there is almost no international standard. No one agrees on the number of volts, the cycle length, um, the number of pins in your plug or the shape of the pins in your plug. That would have been a much simpler thing to come to some uh, norms and some agreements to, but we never, we didn't manage to do that. And AI is a much, much, much more complex technology. So to, to think that we're going to get any agreement I, is I, I think wishful thinking because we didn't manage to do that with electricity. So to think we could do it with a much more complicated thing. Now, of course, human rights are one norm but they're incredibly limited norm. And the rights that you get from human rights are, do not go anyway to um, the, the sorts of harms that AI is going to address and is already starting to, to cause in many countries today. And so the only level that we should be thinking about regulating, I think, is at the national level. Um, and that's where we have teeth and power to do that. Uh, the norms that we're going to agree, uh, that I'm, I'm happy to accept them, but they're going to be so minimal um, that, uh, that uh, we won't be protecting people adequately. Um, and then the final one is, is a philosophical observation, which is that, that there are you know, dozens and dozens of different ethical frameworks that, that emphasize different things. And that's not surprising because there isn't one definitive answer. Ethics is about trading offs, trading off uh, the values of, of the individual against the values of the, of the group. Um, and many different trade-offs of privacy uh, against uh, other, other values that we, that we, um, we have. Um, and so it's all about deciding where, which you value. And in, there are some countries um, in the United States, for example, they will value individual privacy um, much more highly over um, collective welfare. Um, in, in other countries like Japan or, or, or China, um, the collective welfare may be valued much more highly that they're willing to sacrifice various individual rights and privacies and that they're not willing to sacrifice. And so therefore, um, those are things that can only be decided. Those are, those are trade-offs that we will only decide um, at national levels. And so to, to think that we should be regulating these um, internationally is I think wishful thinking and actually in some sense almost harmful. Very interesting, thank you. Um, Anshul, do you have anything you want to add? I guess, because Intel is running a worldwide program. Do you find that you sometimes enter into questions of how to make your your program locally appropriate or um yeah i instead of giving a straight answer because this is a very you know complex topic i will give you an example where we struggled and then we found the solution right so mit moral machine right i mean it's a very cool way of explaining the complexity of fairness and ethics uh, on what is right and what is wrong right uh, a, a very simple trolley problem examples and things like that right so when we go and started implementing it, we got a very different set of responses in South Korean culture versus Korean culture. That's what I was and really struggled a lot when talking to all the experts internally and externally. So for South Korean uh, folks, because there's so much of a gamification inbuilt into their mindset, that was very cool and fun. While when we explained that game, and, and all of you should, uh, I'm, I'm sure you guys have, but from an audience standpoint, go and look at MIT Moral Machine, right? It's a very simple game of ethics, right? So uh, Indian response was totally opposite. They said, oh, how do we explain to people that, hey, this vehicle is going to kill somebody? This is so culturally unacceptable. Do we even go that path, right? And we started getting a lot of, I wouldn't say negativity, but a lot of resistance from senior folks and the ground, you know, actual implementer, teachers, coaches, all the works. So then, I mean, th this was a decision point. What do we do? So uh, we said, okay, instead of we deciding it, which is what we'll end up doing it, we have to make this very inclusive, even from a decision-making standpoint. We, we asked them what would work well if you have to explain this complexity of fairness and ethics to a typical 16, 17 year old, right? So they came up with their own game version. Instead of a technology-driven ethics game version, they came up with a debate-driven game version. So what they started doing was they started dividing teams in groups and said that, okay, in a classroom situation, uh, we will debate. And we, we, we learned from that, that in an Indian culture, the debating will work. In a Korean culture, debating like this will not work. So I think it takes a lot of time to really understand the cultural nuances of this before jumping to a conclusion. That would be my big learning out of this. And we have to really immerse ourselves into the undercurrents of the culture before jumping to any conclusion. Great, really interesting. Thank you. Uh, we have a second question from Inga, who asks, how um, is AI in Asia different 
from AI in other regions? What are some specific regional characteristics, values, traditions, etc.? Um, Toby, would you like to have the first word on this? Do you think there is a distinctive Asia Pacific approach? Well, of, of, of course, we've already touching on the, the the different societal values that we see in in different Asian countries, and I think that's inc incredibly important. That will be incredible. I mean, uh, something else that's really important is, um, of course, all the different languages spoken around this region. And yeah. in some sense, that's a burden. It's it's a it's a barrier to to uh, efficient markets. But equally, it's an opportunity. Um, actually, I think, for example, Europe as well has that great opportunity, which is that um, we're going to have to develop. Uh, AIs that, that understand all these different languages. Um, and that's an opportunity to, to actually remove that barrier, that, that, that competitive barrier that, uh, for example, is, is one reason why the United States has been an economic superpower is because it was such a, a large market that spoke a single language. Um, AI can actually give um, the Pacific Rim back that advantage. It can, it can have um, that, that barrier to, to collaboration and and, and um, e economic activity removed by having AI uh, remove the language barrier. Really interesting. Um, Anshul, did you have any, any thoughts on how you, you think AI in Asia might be distinctive? I, I, again, what we are seeing is in some of the Asian countries, because of the, again, cultures and mindsets, there is a very different resilience compared to European or US one. And uh, the, another observation which I am seeing, and again, this is not research-based, uh, the time to jump from a skilling to entrepreneurial level is probably faster because of the access being better and so on and so forth in some of the Western markets. In markets like Indonesia or India, there is a lot of community ownership, which is very good. But when it comes to translating that community ownership to actual uh, product programs, uh, creation, right? The time, the time taken is probably uh, harder, I mean, despite we providing mentorship and support. And, and again, this is not backed by any research, but probably more the community ownership point. I mean, I'm very fascinated by Indonesian culture. I mean, everything goes at a grassroots. The whole village comes together on issues like this. I mean, same we have, we have seen in Philippines, right? Uh, that that is so very difficult to see in a country like Germany, just to give you an exactly opposite example. So those are some of the things we are learning in this. I, I, one, one more thing, which is I think to, to lump Asia into one yeah, is perhaps, perhaps not actually a very good idea because there Absolutely. are some very different characteristics. So you have some, some countries like Japan and Australia where you will see a, a greatly aging population and all the challenges that that poses and the opportunities that AI poses to deal with that. And then on the other hand, you have some very young, uh, vibrant countries um, like, like India and Indonesia with, with really um, massive populations, the very young uh, populations face quite different opportunities and challenges. I agree. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. And um, with that caveat, Malavika, that obviously it might be hard to generalize across the whole region. Do you think even just picking out specific countries or regions with bits of Asia with which you're familiar, do you have any thoughts on what might be some of the distinctive approaches? I think one other thing that's different is there seems to be a little more of a willingness to accept an automated decision because I think a lot of countries in Asia are used to endemic corruption. So I think this idea of people being venal and corrupt and corruptible and bribable is often offset by the idea that a machine is less biased, a machine is not going to ask for a bribe, a machine is not going to sit on a file until you grease its palm. So I think people are willing to accept that the system might not be perfect, but they still see it as an improvement over what already exists. So I think there's a little bit more of a willingness to engage. And I think that also comes from history, right? In countries that have you know, enlightenment norms and rules and human rights frameworks that actually protect citizens, they're very wary of automation because they fear losing these rights, right? So their sort of calculus for making certain trade-offs is actually very different when in Asia, you, you don't even be, expect those things. And if you have a hint that an automated decision might actually be more fair, I think there is a little bit more of an openness to that. and. Yes, Asia is not a monolith and you have core Asia and which Asia and, you know, all kinds of other axes along which um, there is a lot of divergence.
But I think on the whole, this sort of, I don't want to call it a Confucian ideal necessarily, but this sort of collectivist idea as well of thinking at the level of the family, thinking at the level of the village yeah. is something that you see a little bit more of um, relative to more Western countries, I think. Mm. That's really interesting. And, and, actually and even in terms of how devices are used, right? Whether it's because of poverty or lack of access or other reasons, people share phones, people share laptops, people don't have that sense of, this is my password, my device, and nobody else touches it. Uh, things are used uh, in, in a communal way, which again makes, it, 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 on one way it's great because as a privacy lawyer, I think it's fantastic that it's obfuscating who's using what and you know, you, they, they, their digital footprints are so messy and overlapping each other that I think it's sort of hiding in plain sight, which I think is a wonderful way of like gaming systems by using it in a communal way. Uh, and I think there's a lot of really great opportunities there when, you know, when you also link it with a lot of government initiatives towards open data and open source, um, I think if you can actually take data that's been collected using public funds and that have been used to sort of create more transparency and to sort of, you know, make, make systems and governments more accountable, I think if you could layer um, that onto a lot of these algorithms and systems that are being deployed, I think there's a really great opportunity when it comes to holding governments and holding power to account. So I think much as with my privacy hat on, I'm very nervous about a lot of these techniques. I think with my science fiction hat on and my more, you know, pushing the envelope hat on, like I'm, I'm, I'm really curious to see how these will, these might actually end up with more just outcomes. Mm. Yeah, that's super interesting. And I, I just wanted to pick up on um, the point you made about kind of trust in automated decision making and how that might vary across contexts. Because um, I know Toby made the point earlier about public trust and that being a really important thing to cultivate in order to make sure that AI is deployed responsibly. And you've kind of touched there on why there might be particular contexts in which actually trust is higher because of levels of corruption. Um, and I was just wondering, Toby, if you had thoughts possibly from quite a different Australian context where people are approaching the question differently. How do you think we can build public trust in tech and in AI? Oh, well, I think we could spend, we could spend the rest of the evening talking about this question because it's, it's an incredibly important question. And I think first and foremost, you have to realize is that there isn't one silver bullet. Trust is, is, is a very complex, multi-dimensional thing with many different levels. Um, and I can think about technical um, solutions that help build trust, uh, but equally, there's an inc incredibly important um, socio-political aspect to it um, about um, norms that, uh, that uh, need to be developed and about all the way up to um, norms and, and, and regulation. Um, and so we need all of those things to be happening at the, at the same time. Um, and whether, whether it be you know, providing explanations to decisions and, and and opening out the black boxes um, at the technical level through to um, regulating the tech companies so that they treat our data with a bit more um, respect than they have done. I and mean, certainly there's plentiful bad examples. Um, uh, and, um, but I, you know, I do think there is there's some places where it's very clear right, where we actually have to draw stronger lines in the sand. Um, and I think um, social media is, is a, a, a wonderful example about how we're seeing elections in this region as in every other region being perverted by the misuse of social media um, and in most countries and certainly in this country and in most countries that i know of there are very strict laws about the use of media to traditional old-fashioned media like television because we're, we're very aware of the fact that it's incredibly powerful you can persuade people to vote um, in ways that is not necessarily in their best interest um, and therefore we have laws that limit um, the use of, of conventional media, television, radio, um, because we don't want the media barons to be in charge of uh, the politics in your country. We don't want the people with the most power to be in charge. We want the people with the most democratic support and the best ideas. Um, and yet we've discovered this new form of media, social media, which is in some sense even more powerful magic um, and can uh, with much cheaper and unfortunately AI is behind this. AI is the, is the secret source that allows you to target um, micro-target people and um, the unfortunate problem is that human brains can be hacked. We know that we can manipulate how people vote, 
can manipulate what soap powder they buy, so that's perhaps not too worrying, but we can manipulate how they vote um, and, and pervert the course of, of, of those elections and cause all other untold harms. I mean, uh, can almost, you know, can cause genocide and, and harm, physical harm to be committed on people if we're not careful about this misuse of social media. And I think we really do have to um, make sure and, and call to account um, companies like Facebook because they are doing such a poor job at this. Yeah, absolutely. Really interesting. And I, I wonder, Malavika, especially as a, a, as a lawyer, do you have any thoughts on, um, are there any examples of regulatory approaches you think are successful to uh, addressing some of these uh, problems that Toby's raising? Or are there any kinds of regulation you'd like to see more of to be able to do this difficult job of building trust? I mean, I'm kind of with Lawrence Lessig when it comes to his sort of law of the horse argument, right? When you had carriages, you didn't suddenly decide that you needed to regulate horses, right? And when you had cars, you didn't come up with car specific things alone. And I think we, we, we have tort law, we have product liability, we have consumer protection, we have all kinds of laws that we can already use. So I think I'm a little skeptical about AI only legislation, uh, while recognizing, of course, that there are new problems that don't exist previously. But I think I'm, I'm much more a fan of saying, what are the gaps? What are things that existing legal systems and legislation don't cover or where are they a little outdated or anachronistic in certain ways? Laws created in the 1800s, you know, under colonial regimes for particular kinds of harms. And we've moved on and the language doesn't adapt well. Um, I would really try and plug gaps rather than say we need to have AI specific legislation. I think the GDPR is one example of where, you know, they've updated privacy law generally, but then they have included new provisions relating to automated decision making, right? Um, and I'm much more of a fan of like narrow um, targeted legislation rather than creating catch all AI specific things. Mm. Yeah, that's really interesting. This, we don't we this, don't use the tools we already have. Yeah. Right? We have existing rules of affirmative action. We have rules about product liability. And there are many ways that we can actually use those well. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we don't do enough with the existing tools. And I think a lot of the focus on ethics in particular, uh, while it's wonderful and it's a nice way to bring people to the table to speak with relatively interoperable vocabulary, I think ethics fails where it's not actually actionable. It doesn't lead to sanctions. It doesn't lead to implementation outcomes. So I think ethics is great to sort of build consensus, but you still need to resort to legal systems to actually implement um, rules and regulations and penalties and sanctions. And I think I trust is another really big area where we could be doing a lot more when it comes to the power, and especially when data is concentrated in the hands of a few and platform power is very big. I think with the tech lash, we're going to see a lot more of that. Yeah, really interesting. The, the problem with antitrust is that it's focused on, 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 on whether the consumer is having to pay more. And that's very deceptive when you're looking at services which are given away for free. And there's, you know, on a trivial level, the, how can they not, how, how can there be antitrust problems here when the service is given away for free? But of course, uh, we're seeing these, these immense data monopolies being developed and um, actually, the consumer is in the longer term and in the externalities being suffered. And so actually, we have to take a broader view to antitrust than purely the, the price the consumer is paying today um, and realize that just like every other um, large business that had to be regulated to ensure the market worked um, in the consumer's interest, that just like big oil, big tobacco and big banks and big pharma, we will have to regulate big tech a bit harder. Yeah. Um, Anshul, did you have any final, possibly non-legal thoughts, but more from the perspective of the educational work you do? Do you see any of that playing a role in, in public trust? I guess the public trust is also a function of to what extent we have role modeled governance. And I mean, in my term, democratized complex technology, complex intelligence like AI. Uh, it will take time, but for that, we have to continuously showcase some of the good examples. I mean, there are a lot of bad examples around. There's no doubt about it. 
but can we really celebrate the use cases which touches maximum number of people maybe let's say agriculture right and, uh, and and really show how it is adding value i mean that's where government and industry have to come together and work out uh, as a long term uh, you know solution as one of the long term solution then the trust will start building it i mean it's very natural otherwise because the narrative out there is oh the jobs are disappearing robots are taking away jobs plus all the complexities of social media and everything else which both the esteem speakers have spoken is is a real concern so it's not going to be just straight forward trust building machinery which will work you have to really role model use cases role model solutions build sustainable public private partnerships and that's what we mean by really democratize this yeah really interesting um i'm conscious we we're basically almost out of, well we are out of time but if i could just take a, a couple of minutes more i'd really like each speaker to just say in one minute in the next year what are the some some of the developments in kind of government thinking about deployment of ai what, what are some of the developments you would like to see or if there are things already in in, in process what are the things you're looking out for in the next year um anshul why don't you kick us off human capital make that as a number one priority i would say that i mean i think governments are also enamored by the complexity of technology and all the hype around ai we have to move beyond that and really start thinking about what does national competitiveness mean how do we show local innovation capacity how do we really create a, create businesses solutions cap capacity locally in the complex world which we are living in it all boils down to human capital Great, thank you, um, Toby. What about you? Well, of course, the the elephant in the room we haven't mentioned at all tonight is COVID, and we're going next yeah. year. We're going to be recovering out of COVID, and again, one thing that we should learn from the historical precedent here is that these sorts of crises are often um, impetuses for, for for rapid economic change um, and adoption of things like automation. And so, I think what we need to see. Um, and we are seeing it in many countries, actually, is government supporting people um, through these transitions as they have to, for example, reskill for whatever new jobs and as, as businesses make themselves, as they probably will, much more competitive through automation. And so we're going to see a huge, great continuing. I mean, we've seen a lot of disruption over the last six months, but we're going to this at the only beginning of the disruption. Um, and therefore, it's incredibly important to see the government realizing it's got a really important role. And to spend money in a Keynesian way um, and support people through this transition. Yeah. That COVID has undoubtedly accelerated. Yeah, really interesting. And so right that we haven't mentioned COVID at all, but good to get sneak it in under the wire as a really important um, topical thing for the next year. Um, Malavika, I'll give you the last word. What would you like to see? I think I'd like to see more pilots and impact assessments. Um, I would like to see the growth of more. SDS work rather than seeing this as a very technocratic yield, uh, to see these systems as the socio-technical systems that they are, and to have a more interdisciplinary approach when you unpack harms and solutions, uh, and to truly have diversity. If you have all white men creating tools in Silicon Valley and exporting them to the rest of the world, um, I think that's a problem. So I think being, you know, we talk about diversity and inclusion, um, but I think we really need to give it teeth and actually have more diverse workforces at, at the design level. When you think about defaults, I think that's incredibly important. Great, thank you so much. And thank you so much to all three of the speakers. Um, you've given us all so much to think about and it's been an absolute pleasure to have you here. Thank you to all of the attendees. Um, I'll let you all get on with the rest of your well afternoons and um, I've got a full day of work ahead of me to look forward to since it's only 9am in the UK. But thank you all so much for coming. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Thanks. Thanks, bye.